Another aspect, as I've said, of being president is you get to have another invited lecturer. And I am very pleased and thrilled to have David Sheehan uh, be my invited lecturer. Those of you that know David know that, first of all, he's a professor of surgery at the Harvard Medical School. What you may not know is that he is vice president of the Massachusetts General Center for Quality and Safety and the associate director of the Codman Center. You may know him as, as the chair of the workforce on databases, but he does much more than that. David has fortunately been elected to the National Quality Forum, the arbiter of quality that all of us will have to attain to. He is now on their board of directors and has been elected to their executive committee as well. He is a voice in the nation for cardiac and thoracic surgery. And David, I'm pleased to have you here today to provide this year's President's Invited Lecture entitled Codsman's Legacy, Data, Reporting, and Professional Responsibility. David. Well, I'm deeply honored that my friend <coughs> Rich Prager asked me to be, the, to be his presidential invited speaker. When Rich and I first uh, spoke about this, um, he said, Dave, you can talk about anything you want, but just don't dwell on the accomplishments of the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons, uh, an organization which you all know uh, owes so much to his vision and leadership. Well, notwithstanding uh, that request, um, I just have to tell you that I am in awe of what uh, the Michigan group, uh, led by uh, Rich and others, have, have accomplished. And uh, uh, I think it is a model for the country, and Rich is taking some of those lessons uh, to the rest of the country through his leadership role in the Quality Initiatives Task Force of the STS. I think uh, that group uh, illustrates perfectly the vision uh, of the subject of uh, my talk today, Ernest Amory Codman, uh, an individual who wrote uh, and practiced over a century ago, but whose ideas really are just gaining traction uh, today. I'm not going to dwell extensively on Codman's fascinating uh, personal history, which many of you may be familiar with. Rather, I'm going to um, try to lay out for you uh, his vision uh, and the principles he had uh, for uh, enhancing quality uh, in healthcare. Uh, sadly, many of these issues will seem very familiar to all of you today, uh, which tells us a little bit uh, something about how far we have or haven't come. Uh, and I'm going to measure uh, the accuracy of his vision and his predictions about healthcare quality against our own experience in healthcare over the last. Uh, couple of decades, both overall and in uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgery. So Cobman was born uh, in 1869, four years after the end of the War of Northern Aggression. And uh, he, uh, this was the same year as Harvey Cushing was born. Cushing was, as you know, the father of American neurosurgery. And they were lifelong best friends, something you may not be aware of. They were both uh, uh, came from Puritan roots dating back to the 1600s. Uh, uh, Codman was the archetypal Boston Brahmin, uh, educated at Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, MGH, uh, married into uh, a very prominent, uh, socially and medically uh, prominent Boston family, uh, the Bowditches. He was the father of American shoulder surgery, uh, uh, a passion that he developed while studying in Europe. Uh, and published the classic uh, treatise on this subject in 1934, The Shoulder. He was a pioneer in the use of x-rays. Uh, I saw John Meyer here. John, uh, you may be aware that Codman was in fact the first radiologist in chief at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, he also was the fluoroscopist for Walter Cannon's famous uh, uh, study of esophageal motility. And he was an MGH surgeon on Harrington's East Surgical Service, and I suspect that there are some individuals here today, including myself, who spent a lot of time on that East Surgical Service as house officers. Made seminal contributions to the surgery of the stomach and duodenum, uh, developed the first cancer registry in the US, the bone sarcoma registry, founding member of the American College of Surgeons and its uh, chair of its Committee on Hospital Standardization, which was the precursor of the Joint Commission. So by any measure, we would say this guy is a superstar. So what happened? Um, in reality, for a good bit of his surgical career, Codman was uh, considered a nuisance uh, by his contemporaries. He was ostracized, ridiculed, isolated, 
He lost his Harvard appointment. He had to give up multiple leadership roles in local and national organizations. He founded a private hospital that was a financial failure despite having exemplary clinical outcomes. And he was buried in an unmarked grave in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Um, today, he is widely regarded as one of the most influential surgeons in U.S. history. Uh, this is the headstone that Andy Warshaw, currently the uh, president of the American College of Surgeons, arranged to have placed this past summer on Codman's uh, gravesite. It reads, the father of outcomes assessment and quality measurement in healthcare. It may take a hundred years for my ideas to be accepted. That's a Codman quote. So where did this obsession with uh, measuring quality come from? I'd like to think it probably originated in this event, which is recounted in a fascinating series of letters published in an article uh, by the Chief of Anesthesia at Mass General in 1940. But it talks about some, uh, an exchange of letters uh, between Cushing, Codman, and the superintendent of Mass General that took place in 1920. They described an event in 1894 at which Codman and Cushing were both uh, sitting up in one of the surgical amphitheaters at MGH uh, watching a case when they were called down uh, to administer ether anesthesia, anesthesia, something for which neither of them uh, had been trained or was capable. Uh, the patient promptly aspirated and died. And the surgeon actually continued on with the operation as a demonstration uh, to those in the amphitheater. Well, Cushing, in particular, was devastated. He describes how he walked North Boston uh, all afternoon uh, and then went to the home of the surgeon that evening, um, saying, I, I'm going to leave medicine. Uh, is there anything I can do to make up for what I've done? And this is the response of the surgeon. To my perfect amazement, I was told it was nothing at all. That sort of thing happened frequently. I better forget about it and go on with medical school. I went on with medical school, but I've never forgotten about it. Codman and I resolved that we'd improve our technique of giving ether. We both became much more skillful, particularly due to the detailed attention we had to put upon the patient by the careful recording of the pulse rate throughout the operation. Now, Codman wanted to write up this and other ether-related complications, um, but as he wrote to Harvey Cushing in 1920, the reason for not publishing was I took it to Call Warren. That's John Collins Warren, the great Warren family, uh, really founded MGH, who regarded it as too frank for the good of the hospital for it described in detail the case which I lost. So what did Codman take away from this? First of all, the importance of recording data. Second of all, uh, competence, which they clearly did not have when they administered anesthesia. Third, uh, the reluctance to be transparent about both our good and bad results, uh, and the need for uh, accountability. If you want to read about the state of surgery 100 years ago, a good place to start is this very nice article by Peter Kernahan several years ago, uh, in which uh, he describes really the shameful state of our profession a century ago. And it, this one quote is particularly interesting. It's by what we would today call an investigative reporter, Norm uh, Barnesby. It would be futile to attempt to estimate the amount of suffering caused by the ignorance, incompetence, commercialism, and criminal indifference of those who call themselves disciples of Esculapius. This, of course, is the famous Codman cartoon, which, uh, with an artistic mixed metaphor, uh, does the same thing. It shows the Back Bay Golden Goose Ostrich. Ostrich because the wealthy folks uh, in the Back Bay uh, were not interested in finding out what the results were of the people to whom they were laying these golden eggs, uh, which were the surgeons and physicians uh, of that period. Codman uh, had a uh, tremendously productive uh, career, and many of his articles were in what was called the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which in fact was the precursor of the New England Journal. Uh, whether it was an article on chronic appendicitis or an article, of a tremendously prescient article on cons compulsory health insurance, every single one of these articles, as well as his monograph, a study in hospital efficiency, and his book on the shoulder, every single one of them contains huge sections on this issue of quality. And let me just uh, extract some of the most important ones for you uh, to give you a sense of, of Codman's, uh, the breadth of his vision. First of all, lack of accountability and transparency. The truth is patients and the publics do not understand the problem. They suppose that somebody's looking into this important matter. 
They don't realize that the responsibility is not fixed upon any person or department. The trustees do not consider it their duty to see that good results are obtained in the treatment of their patients. Few trustees even make the effort to see whether their patients are cured. Much less do they attempt to place any responsibility in the members of their staffs for failure to cure or relieve. This method will put an end to the old experimental surgery where each operator took a try at each new operation and reported only the good results. And with the tipping, typical biting sarcasm of Codman, he said, this will discourage hasty diagnosis and thoughtless operating by busy men with great reputations. Uninformed consumer choice. How can an ordinary citizen select a physician under the present conditions? Do the hospital trustees themselves know who's competent? One solution was public reporting. I look forward to the day when endowed institutions, by the publication of their clinical results, will perform a part of their duty to their communities in letting people know what physicians and surgeons have proved themselves competent to cure or relieve every pathological condition. By putting the results in the record, the patient will be protected and the operator will have the strongest incentive, incentive to excel. He realized that the end result of all this was not measurement but improvement. And he, he put forth this statement. Now, you've probably seen the upper part of this. A requirement for improvement is that you have to find out your results, analyze them, and compare them with those of other hospitals. You need to collect and analyze data. What typically is not presented in uh, articles on Cobbin is the last part of the same statement, where he says, you must care for what cases you can care for well and avoid attempting for cases which they are not qualified to care for well and must assign cases to members of the staff for better reasons than seniority, the calendar, or temporary convenience. And I just have to say, uh, things haven't changed much in 100 years. Measurements unsettling, difficult, time-consuming, and troublesome, and by pointing out lines for improvement uh, to much con uh, onerous con uh, committee work. So once you, once you measure, uh, there's an the inevitable drive to try to improve. And uh, you need to have a uniform, scientific valid, uh, scientifically valid methodology. Uh, the tables that were being reported at that time looked well in the report. They impressed the trustees and subscribers. But other than that, they're not used by anybody. Too inaccurate and too diverse in plan and method of classification to be of service, uh, either for comparison for one another or for large statistics. Great hospitals like MGH have a duty to perform to medical and surgical science. By grouping cases into series large enough to favor comparative studies, so there's the whole sample size issue, and by observing definite previously determined points, a rational clinical science can be established. A very modern concept. And so let me just try to put all these things together very quickly. Accountability, an ethical duty to the community, beneficence, uh, providing the best possible care, Autonomy, a fundamental ethical right of patients to know who it is that's taking care of them and how competent they are. The advancement of surgical science and outcomes research, the elimination of waste and the provision of high value. Uh, surgeon, hospital, and regional referral based on expertise, outcomes, and volume. And promotion of leaders based on clinical competence. And he also uh, presaged a, a 21st century vision of rational clinical science and every one of these elements is something that we think about every day uh, as we're developing statistical models, for example. So how did he propose going about doing this? Well, this is a, an example of his so-called end result card. Uh, it's like a database entry today. It has all the basic demographic and clinical information as well as uh, follow-up. Uh, he classified imperfect results uh, due to various types of surgeon error but also recognized inherent patient risk as being a contributor to poor outcomes, and this was the so-called PD category. Uh, every single patient, uh, 337 of them that he uh, took care of in his own private hospital, uh, was written up in uh, this uh, very famous book, uh, Study in Hospital Efficiency, uh, in which he assigned himself uh, error categories where a patient had less than a perfect result. And in a precursor to an Excel spreadsheet, he actually plotted every single patient in one of these cells based on their anatomy and uh, their pathology. So let's look in, at detail in just a couple of these areas and ask the question, uh, how have we embraced uh, Codman's vision today, 100 years later? 
Well, first of all, um, I was absolutely blown away uh, to look at uh, the table you see over on the left-hand side. This appeared in the uh, Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, New England Journal, in 1902, 112 years ago. What it is is a list of every single case done two years previously at MGH on the East Surgical Service. And the column categories you can't read easily, so I reproduced them up at the top. Number treated, number traced, perfect result, good result, no improvement, bad result, died and died after discharge. So, uh, but the unique thing about it is that with Dr. Harrington's approval, they actually had mailed every patient that had been done in 1900 uh, from June to October and asked them to come in at around 11 in the morning during the first two weeks of June. Over half the patients showed up uh, and uh, they were simply asked, you know, how are you doing? Uh, confirmed that they were alive, obviously. Uh, an example of long-term follow-up that we don't even have today in most of our specialties. How are we doing in cardiothoracic surgery with regard to this? Well, here's a statement uh, taken directly from our website. We thought a lot about this, uh, and I hope that everybody in this room believes that public reporting is the right thing to do, and STS regards it as a professional responsibility. We do publish uh, both on consumer reports and on our own website. Uh, the results of those programs uh, that give consent, uh, right now it's about 42% of the programs in the country, and we're expanding our measure portfolio to cover most major CT procedures. Uh, we started off with isolated cabbage, but we're trying to catch up with what Codman did 114 years ago where he talked about all the procedures that were done on the East Surgical Service. Now, whenever you talk about public reporting and accountability, you've got to talk about the other side of it, which is this issue of risk aversion. Uh, this is a very well-known paper by Amoy Gui from the Cleveland Clinic uh, commenting on what happened in their experience after public reporting was initiated in New York State. Uh, the patients they were seeing from New York after that tended to be sicker than they had been previously and they were sicker compared to patients from other states. And they uh, uh, concluded from this that New York doctors had become risk averse. And I think there's no question that that took place. And there are numerous other papers written subsequently uh, that have shown uh, some degree of risk aversion in surgery, in PCI, and so forth. I think we sometimes forget, though, that this, whatever is driving risk aversion has, uh, has a bad effect, which is denial of care to patients who may benefit from aggressive therapy, but it also has a couple of potentially good effects one of which is sorting high-risk patients to more experienced hospitals and physicians, and another one of which is the rejection of patients who really have almost no hope of benefit. Now, the remarkable thing to me is that in an era when there really was no public reporting except for his own nascent efforts, uh, Codman completely understood this issue. Here in his classic uh, article, uh, The Product of a Hospital, 1913, uh, he writes this, but if we think too much about mortality, shall we not fail to do desperate operations, which we should do? And he takes the example of gastrectomy for cancer, where mortality rates were close to 50% there. A mortality even as high as 50% is justifiable because unfavorable as well as favorable cases should be done. And then he talks about the kind of person that needs to do these tough cases. To be successful with his operation, a man should have and this is obviously uh, 100 years ago, so please forgive me, but a man should have great surgical skill, special training on animals, abundant opportunities to do the operation, and security of reputation so that his private practice will not be ruined by the necessarily high mortality. Not a bad suggestion uh, even today, I would say. So how do you mitigate risk aversion? Certainly by providing optimal risk adjustment, by perhaps separately auditing and identifying and, uh, and reporting or even excluding the highest risk patients, the patient that comes in in shock or coma. Having a broader range of quality measures so you're not focusing only on mortality. Uh, appropriateness review, not just of patients who are undergoing procedures, but patients who are rejected for a procedure. Were they appropriately rejected? And then finally, matching high-risk patients to high-performing experienced surgeons. Beneficence, uh, a fundamental uh, ethical principle in healthcare, providing the best possible care to the patient. Uh, there are a couple of uh, different issues that have to be considered when you're talking about what motivates us uh, to uh, improve our performance. 
Uh, there are external motivators, things like public reporting, pay for performance, penalties, and then there are intrinsic motivators. And there's a very nice series of articles uh, uh, summarizing some of the work that's been done in the social sciences. Chris Castle, Sashin Jain have written about this. Uh, that professionals, and the people in this room I think are consummate professionals, are really driven by a professional sense of responsibility to deliver the best care. There's an issue of personal satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment, there's your public reputation, appreciation of patients, and the respect of your colleagues. So these intrinsic motivators may in fact be much more effective than extrinsic uh, or external motivators to do a good job. But in Codman's time, uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of that intrinsic motivation. It just wasn't part of, uh, of their ethos. And so they really had to, or Codman had to focus more on the external motivators putting the results on record so that the operator would be, have the strongest incentive to excel. And the other thing that Common realized is that you had to be data-driven. Uh, find out, analyze, and compare results. Uh, now, in the early experience from New York, it looked as though that external motivation factor uh, might, in fact, be the most important, at least in our specialty, because uh, they uh, associated their 40% decrease in risk-adjusted mortality after public reporting uh, with the dissemination of their data. But lo and behold, several years later, uh, Jerry O'Connor reports the results from the Northern New England Cardiovascular Disease Study Group showing almost identical reductions in mortality from a program that had no public reporting uh, but was a regional collaborative with confidential best practice uh, uh, sort of approach um, so, so what is going on? Well, it turns out that uh, in subsequent reviews that have been done, uh, including this one by Fung several years ago, uh, the effectiveness of public reporting on, the effect of public reporting on effectiveness, safety, and patient-centeredness remains uncertain. It's really difficult to find many articles that show uh, an improvement in outcomes, not processes, but outcomes that are directly related to public reporting. I am uh, a strong advocate of public reporting, but I, I'm an advocate because it's, it's our ethical responsibility for accountability, not because I think it's the only way uh, to improve our practice. I think the real common denominator is the second thing that Cobbin mentioned, which is data. Uh, and there are many ways that data can feed quality improvement so that we can give the best possible care to our patients. One is the feedback of nationally benchmarked data uh, internally to your program uh, so that you can see uh, how you're doing in terms not just of outcomes but cross-clamp times and, and so forth. And we try to uh, provide information, uh, drill down uh, so that you can uh, assess specific areas where you're strong or weak. Uh, it can inform quality leaders whether it's at the local level, state level, uh, regulators uh, or national level can identify high and low uh, performers, early de uh, detection of deteriorating performance, the ro basis for robust m and data-driven remediation, and so forth. <clears throat> data can also improve quality by being the basis for clinical research and comparative effectiveness research. It can be the basis for regional quality initiatives, and I just show three here, Northern New England, uh, Rich Prager's group in Michigan, and Jeff uh, Riches and Alan Spears' uh, efforts in Virginia. National quality initiatives. This is work done by Bruce Ferguson a decade or so ago uh, on IMA use and beta blocker use. Uh, again, very data-driven uh, quality improvement initiatives. Uh, the work that Rich is leading uh, with our STS Quality Initiatives Task Force, uh, where we've developed online uh, library of best uh, uh, manuscripts in certain areas and have a, uh, developed a number of very uh, professionally done webinars uh, on important areas uh, uh, that can help drive improvement. Uh, if we believe in patient-centeredness um, and shared decision-making, uh, data can uh, uh, make sure that every patient uh, has the kind of information they really need in order to make uh, an informed decision. Uh, they can have uh, information on appropriateness of their procedure, the risk of death and major complications, long-term survival, freedom from complication, uh, recurrence and intervention, and alternative therapies. This is the kind of information that really leads to true autonomous decision-making, uh, which is one component of quality. And then uh, using data to uh, improve quality uh, 
can also um, uh, be in the area of complex and infrequently performed procedures where uh, there is a strong volume, volume outcome association. I've just shown a couple of them uh, down here, aortic surgery, uh, uh, mitral uh, surgery for mitral regurgitation, repair versus replacement. Uh, this is another area where Codman was uh, incredibly insightful, where he talked about um, how uh, men undertake treatment without proof that uh, they have, uh, have the qualifications to undertake the treatment of unusual or difficult conditions. Uh, read uncommon, uh, very complex. Uh, and this is what they did at Mass General, and again, we're talking about uh, a century ago. In answer to similar unpleasant questions, the surgical staff at MGH reorganized in such a way that each active member of the staff undertook to give special study to some difficult class of cases, and in return, the hospital assigned to each member all the cases of that group. Uh, I was thinking about that uh, in an earlier presentation uh, about what Bob Guyton had done with the aortic surgery group um, and aortic dissection at Emory. Uh, the result has been that the mortality in these groups of cases showed a great improvement and our community has at its service a few men qualified to do each of these difficult operations. Uh, what a great concept, a hundred years ago. Do we do that today? Some institutions, yes but uh, I would say that nationally, we're not doing this. Patient autonomy and informed provider choice. How can an ordinary citizen select a physician under the current conditions? This is the question posed by Codman a century ago. Uh, it was his premise, his hypothesis, that having data out there, in public reporting, uh, would in fact provide consumers the information they need and that they would uh, react in a, uh, an appropriate manner and choose higher quality uh, providers. Well, in fact, it's been very difficult to, to demonstrate uh, that his uh, prediction was accurate. These are data uh, by Mark Chasson, who's the president of the Joint Commission. Uh, this is from about a decade ago, uh, but it has not changed very much. He looked at the uh, lowest mortality programs in New York, uh, before uh, and after public reporting, and the highest mortality. Uh, and he looked at the, at the percentage of market share the year before they were named the lowest performing, uh, lowest mortality, excuse me, and the year after they were named the lowest. And the same for year after being uh, named highest um, uh, or uh, the highest uh, mortality programs. And in fact, there was absolutely no uh, significant change in market share of those programs. So it's been very hard to demonstrate that all the public reporting we do has really had an impact on market share. And in fact, this Cochrane review from a couple years ago uh, found that there was no consistent evidence that public release of performance data changed consumer behavior or improved care. So what can we do uh, to try to make our public reporting uh, even more effective than it is today? Uh, and one of the reasons that um, public reporting has, in fact, not been uh, particularly effective. Patients are many times are unaware of the report cards. Many of the things, particularly in our specialty, uh, that patients are going into the hospital for, uh, they don't have time to uh, look at the, at the most recent uh, uh, report card. Uh, it's an urgent or emergent uh, case. Uh, there are many studies showing that patients generally do not understand uh, many of the report cards that are out there. Uh, there's little provider differentiation, largely because of the huge amount of random variation that there is. Um, patients like to rely on the preferences of their uh, family and their PCP. They prefer local care, even when regional centers 20 miles away may have two or three times lower mortality. Uh, there's a lack of financial incentives, at least historically, to choose wisely, but that's all going to change. Uh, some plans limit the choice of providers, that's another factor. And fine, there's a, finally, and this is a very important one, there's a lack of methodological standards in developing these report cards and that leads to conflicting and confusing results. Um, and, and again, Codman was so, uh, so foresighted in, in recognizing this, he talks uh, in this famous article, Uniformity of Hospital Morbidity Reports, he talks about how these uh, reports that were being published at that time were too inaccurate and diverse in plan and method of classification to be of service for comparison or for large series. 
Well, this is the Health Association of New York report from last year, uh, which I highly commend to you. And it, it, its whole theme is how confusing report cards are because you can look at the same hospital with six different rating systems and it can be anything from the worst to the best. This is my favorite current example. Over in the upper left-hand corner, you see the most recent U.S. News and World Report orthopedic surgery ratings. Um, you'll see that the Hospital for Special Surgery is rated as the number one orthopedic institution in the nation with a perfect score of 100%. On the right-hand bottom, uh, you'll see the Consumer Reports um, safer surgery ratings from roughly the same period, uh, and they looked at two uh, particular uh, uh, very common orthopedic procedures, hip and knee replacement, a large part of every orthopedic surgeon's practice. Uh, what are the worst hospitals in the nation to go to? The black circle of death, uh, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Now, folks, I just have to say, these both can't be right. So what is a consumer to do looking at these two sets of, uh, of report cards? And that's the problem. There are no standards nationally. We're trying to set the standards, but um, the rest of the country is pretty far behind us. Uh, there is evidence that all this is going to change. Uh, this is a Kaiser, Foundation, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation report from a few, a few years ago showing that patients are progressively relying more on data and less on uh, the... Uh, suggestions of their PCP or their family and friends. And I think that with healthcare reform, more consumer friendly reports, with growing patient interest and engagement, with steerage by payers, with accountable care organizations, differential co pays, all these things are going to make uh, these rating systems have much more uh, market impact. So let me wrap up uh, with my assessment of, of Codman's vision and principles and uh, how accurate they were. I think he was right about the professional ethical responsibility uh, to make results public. Uh, that's the principle of accountability. We're beginning to embrace this concept, uh, particularly at the hospital level, uh, and I think our, um, uh, our profession is really out in front on this. Uh, I think we still, as a uh, profession, uh, fail to intervene effectively with under-providing providers, underperforming providers. I think everybody in this room probably knows uh, people in their hospital that no doctor would send their family member to. Uh, why do we allow that to happen? Um, shame on us. Um, Codman understood that data are essential for improvement, and this is a fundamental premise of STS performance improvement activities. He understood this concept of risk aversion and that we uh, uh, needed to better match uh, surgeon expertise and the highest risk patients. Uh, he embraced this concept of specialization and regionalization for complex or volume sensitive procedures. Uh, I think uh, it's a concept that uh, has been too long in coming and uh, there are programs represented by people in the audience today uh, that are, have embraced this, and I think we need to continue along those lines. Uh, his views on the lack of consumer and market impact uh, are just as true today as they were 100 years ago, but I think it's going to change. Uh, his recommendations regarding standardized data and statistical methodologies were right on target, and we use every one of them today. Uh, we've used STS data to advance surgical science, as he uh, advocated, uh, and we're just beginning to use our data to advance his vision of reducing waste and improving value. And the key to that is going to be linking our STS clinical data with various uh, other sources that can give us uh, cost and resource use uh, so that we can have things like risk-adjusted uh, resource utilization. So uh, in summary, I think uh, Ernest Amory Common was a uh, truly remarkable and prescient uh, uh, surgeon, uh, someone who we could all uh, do well to emulate. Uh, I think the Society uh, of Thoracic Surgeons and the Southern uh, Thoracic Surgical Association uh, uh, memberships uh, are, are really uh, leaders uh, in the things that, uh, that Codman embraced. I want to thank Rich Prager uh, and the association for the opportunity to have made these few remarks. Thank you very much.